My first question would have to be, how much has technology changed the way you actually live and, and do journalism in your work and daily life? I mean, it's changed everything, really. The, the, the definition of who is a journalist has changed um, dramatically in just the amount of time I've even been at the New York Times, which is, you know, seven years. Um, we have people now who are come from a very traditional technology background who are journalists. We have people now on the graphics team who are statisticians. We have people who are um, motion graphics, you know, 3D animation specialists. So, so the, 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 the range of uh, skills that are now commonplace, at least in this newsroom, um, are so wide that it's, it's sort of hard to even recognize um, the newsroom anymore. I mean, we just had our Pulitzer Prizes today, and as you know, Snowfall won for feature uh, for feature writing. But truly, the the and John Branch would be the first one to say this. The what really made that piece special was the multimedia treatment, was the motion graphics, was the work of the graphics desk, and and the amazing um, design treatment. So, I mean, it's changed everything. All right, so I know uh, you have co-founded Hacks and Hackers to get together with Bert Herman. And I was wondering, um, what do you think about the current trend with uh, hyper-local and uh, citizen journalism? Where do you think that's going? Well, at least here, that's actually not relatively, I mean, relatively speaking, that's actually not a fairly new trend. The sort of hyper-local thing that that kind of came and I'm sorry to say largely went um, a few years ago. It's been a while since uh, you, you hear again a little bit of muttering about hyperlocal, but that was really the Lawrence, um, uh, the Lawrence, Kansas paper. Uh, a couple of folks who came out of there uh, in like the early 2000s, that was a really big deal. and. Um, I think the the idea of hyper local has sort of um, has sort of gone away a, a little bit as a focus. Uh, what and what was the other the other trend? That you were, oh, citizen. citizen yeah, I mean, citizen journalism is interesting. It's a the trend. I mean, it was a very big deal. I mean, it was a very big buzzword. It has been for a while, and I don't think anybody really knows quite what it means. Um, uh, and there are all kinds of approaches to quote unquote citizen journalism from, you know, blogging, obviously, um, through UGC, through, you know, a lot of things that we're doing. Um, CNN, obviously, with iReport has made a big, big investment in it. So, I mean, I think you've seen some um, big media organizations do a lot of interesting things with citizen journalism and with UGC, um, including this one. But um yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's the, you know, earth changing, uh, industry changing trend that we might have thought it was. Your partner at Hacks and Hackers, Bert Terman, actually said that um, what re it really is is uh, citizen reporting, not journalism. Because in order to be a journalist, you need to be able to do other things as well. Do you agree with him? Uh, I don't know. I I don't. I, I'm not sure exactly what the context was or whatever. I mean, I, I see a lot of great citizen journalism. I, I read a lot of great citizen journalism, and I don't really, I don't know. I, I kind of hate that term. It sounds like, it kind of sounds to me a little bit like, I don't know, something you might hear in Soviet Russia, citizen journalism. It sounds a little weird to me. But um, uh, I, I just see a lot of, a really good writing and and really good reporting by people who are not paid journalists necessarily. So I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you could try to draw lines between it, but I don't. I don't see that. What you don't see a lot of, and I'll tell you that right now, is you don't see a lot of citizen investigative journalism. Right. Um, 
And so, you know, like looking today at the at the project that David Barstow did, the the Walmart investigation, which was, I think, an 18 month investigation involving, you know, God knows how many sources. Um, ah, I'll get that later. All right. Uh, uh, wait, hang on. I got to answer this. Sorry. All right. No, 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 no. Can I call you back? Okay, bye. All right. This is a fantastic interview, isn't it? Um, <laughs> uh, 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 oh, good grace. I want, you just have to promise me that every, every pitfall, pratfall that we've had on this call has got to go into the YouTube video. It all has to go. Really? All right. <laughs> I'll go from including me sitting back like this with my head like that. All right. All right. I promise. It's um, going to be less editing for me. Yeah, just much less editing. Um, no, but you don't see, I mean, it's just, there's no way. This is where citizen journalism, the, the, the real citizen journalism um, zealots, let's call them that. Um, that'll get me in trouble, but whatever. Um, the real zealots, um, this is where they have no answer. You know, there's been a lot of experiments, pro, you know, pros mixed with amateurs and stuff like this. But you're not going to get, you're just not going to get the kind of, serious watchdog reporting this two-year investigation that involved, you know, God knows how much in terms of resources um, to uncover a story of the significance of the, of the Walmart piece. You're just not going to get it. So that's the one piece of citizen journalism I don't think anybody's ever had a clear answer for. What about data journalism? Where, what's the state of the art with data journalism now? Well, part of the problem is that nobody really has a single definition of what you mean when you talk about data journalism. Right. I guess my own view of data journalism is that is a pretty all-encompassing, um, I have a pretty all-encompassing definition. So I would say that it's a continuum of trends starting, you know, in the, you know, way back 35, 40 years ago with the early attempts to bring social science and this and statistics into journalism. And I think you see that all the way up through the, you know, the current era where, you know, data journalism can mean everything from, oh, this is ridiculous. Hang on. Hey, what's up? I'm, I'm doing a Skype interview right now. Can I call you back in a minute? Okay, bye. <laughs> this is fantastic. It's, it's awesome. This is going to be so good. You are uh, a very busy man. <laughs> uh, call what can I do I can't turn off my phone I probably can turn off my phone I just don't know how um, what were we talking about oh data journalism we don't know what it is so right through the current um, you know state of the art I would say where people talk about data visualization and big data and and you know web apps or, or news applications and all the rest so um, I, I see it as a big as a continuum and in terms of what the most interesting sort of trends are, I definitely think it's around, around data and the use of uh, sort of data, of, of data science, of techniques that are useful for uh, data science in, in journalism. And we're starting to go down that road a little bit here um, with some things that we're working on in, in Washington, in our Washington Bureau. But I, I, I really think that that's where um, that's where the really interesting work is going to be in the next, say, two to three years. So how was the Document Cloud born? How was Document Cloud born? Yeah. So Document Cloud was born, uh, well, uh, was born of frustration with news organizations like this one um, that either did not publish source documents when they published large sprawling investigations or important document-based journalism. Um, or when they did publish them, it was published as a big, ugly, useless uh, PDF, you know? And the, 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 really it started with the Clinton Library when years ago when in, two, right, I think it was 2008, um, 2007, maybe it was 2007, um, uh, when the Clinton Library released the schedules of uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, her complete schedules, and it was like 17,000 pages, and a lot of news organizations just posted that online, 
And you know, what are you going to do with seventeen thousand pages of PDF, you know seventeen thousand page PDF as a reader? Um, that's ridiculous. So we created what we called the document viewer to upload that and make it into something that was more web friendly, searchable. We could bookmark key spots, and that was kind of the genesis of Document Cloud, which um, uh, which started actually as a conversation between Scott Klein, myself, and Eric Umansky at ProPublica, they were, in, they were just getting started and they wanted to use Document Viewer. But then we started talking about, well, hell, if you guys are gonna use this, maybe, shoot, we could turn this into kind of a, uh, a thing that all news organizations could use. And then we started thinking about, well, if you started networking like that, what are the other interesting things that you might be able to do? And that's how it kind of got going. Awesome. Um, it, Really, until Document Cloud, there really hasn't been a good tool to publish source documents in the way that journalists need to publish them online. So that was, we were solving a problem. It's pretty much that simple. Awesome. Um, you know, one of the major questions that uh, we've been hearing during the last few years, um, at least in, on this side of the world, is the fact that um, since uh, social media and uh, all the online websites and online and newsrooms are making things so much um, faster that the quality is actually um, suffering from it. So how do you think these two um, aspects go along together? I'm not sure if I agree with that. I think that speed can still mean great journalism. And I, I think now we also have to just recognize whether we like it or not that this is a reality. And, right. and that, you know, maybe we always used to say that journalism is the first draft of history. That's kind of the thing we always used to say. Well, maybe then sites like BuzzFeed or, or maybe your Twitter feed, that's the first draft of journalism. And, and we just have to recognize that that's the way the world's headed. And, you know, one of the things that will not change, and actually it's an environment in which I feel very comfortable uh, working at a, a news organization like this one, because say what you will about the New York Times, but people still trust our judgment. And when the New York Times says something happened, um, you can pretty much be sure that it happened. And that's sort of the difference between, that's one of the things that we bring that very few uh, of these newer news organizations, outlets, whatever you want to call them, but they, ha they don't have that out of the gate. So I think we can play a very important role in helping to, in an environment in which information is ubiquitous, but fact can be fleeting, where we can play a very important role of, of helping readers understand um, you know, what, what's going on, separating fact from fiction, things like that. Awesome. Uh, one last question, and I'm sorry. It's, uh, gotta, gotta go. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, no worries. Uh, did you hear what happened in Boston just a few... Yeah, I've got it up on my other monitor right here, as a matter of fact, sure. Right. Do you Can you tell us something about it? Because it's like breaking news over here and it's I, late at night. So. Yeah, I wish I could tell you more than 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 what you have. I, I, we, I was standing at the Pulitzer uh, presentation when this happened, so I don't know right. much more than you do, but it's a pretty horrific uh, incident. It looks like at least two people dead, so... Who yeah, knows? a lot injured, and we've heard that they closed the, the air space above Boston, the, New York, and the... Washington, so. Yep. Not nice at all. All righty. Okay, Aaron, okay. thank you very much. Thank you.